Thank you very much and good afternoon, good evening, whatever. Um, I decided to take this opportunity, I mean, the fact that I've been invited for a kind of digital humanities project to, in a way, say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to say thank you to, to the world, I would say, of art and humanities, because I think um, is enriching a lot a practice that we are representing nowadays, that is data visualization, that it tends to become often very cold, technology-driven, business-driven. And um, sometimes we lose our, let's say, track. And I'm really, really happy to be working with art, humanities, and social sciences, because sometimes it, it, this reminds us who we are as designers and how much uh, human based we should be and sometimes we don't have so um well i i'm i'm paolo i'm the one on top of this pyramid <laughs> but it's not by chance that the basis of this pyramid is becoming very big and that's um as molly said is probably the most important part of density design what is now so all these folks and people that passed through by the lab and then now are spreading around the world, mostly in the United States. I don't know if I should be happy about that, but uh, spreading the voice and you know, bringing our activity all across the world. And on the right, you see some, some projects in, in our website. Um, let me uh, give a kind of very short, uh, well, it will not be so short, preface of my story about the relationship with humanities and, and social sciences. I mean, I, I think that as we designers, we are in a very uh, interesting position. So as someone said uh, years ago, there is no well understood definition for design. And this is a, both a, bo a bad thing and, and a good thing because it keeps us very open and alive, I would say. So as we don't know exactly what we are, we tend to doubt about ourselves and to open to, to the others. And that's, I think, why we... Um, we say often that design is a kind of a interdisciplinary, integrative discipline by nature, because we don't know exactly what we are, so we are very open to any contribution. This, this normally um, feed our tendency to disciplinary promiscuity, and that's something that we, we want to feed and we are proud of in a way, and also our capacity to borrow <laughs> tools and methods for, especially methods from other disciplines. And not by chance, the two main disciplines I would like to talk about today are the ones that you decided to put in the same building here in Pittsburgh. And I, I like that also very much. So it's about humanities and social sciences. How the story began. I mean, we met more or less uh, in the same period of our life as a research lab, these two disciplines. It was around 2010, 2011. That was the time where we met first sociology a specific kind of sociology, sociology of science, and I would say sociology of scientific knowledge through the work of a person that has really, in a way, changed our research path. Is that, that person is Bruno Latour, is a philosopher of science and some other things. And through the idea of uh, this um, actor network theory, it really drove us into a, a topic that um, we are still working on, the cartography of controversies that is quite fruitful. I will not explain now what is the theory of, of Latour, but what is interesting in this uh, cartographic approach to, to, to the world and to societal challenges is that you have to, uh, before anything else, you observe and describe what you want to act on. And this process of observing and description is something that designers have, can have a role in. We worked together three years in a European funded project that is called eMaps, Electronic Maps for Assist Public Science. And that was a very, very fruitful uh, work. We worked uh, on climate change. That is one of the most controversial issue. It's, I think it's still the most controversial page you can find in Wikipedia. And it's a very controversial issue that can be, according to the cartography of controversies, uh, observed as a kind of a uh, dynamic of power between entities. And this can be mapped through the actor network, and at the end, it becomes a kind of a visualization of a graph that represents these forces. All these relationships of power are mapped through the uh, web, 
So um, these are the words of some other partners we had in, in, the, in this European funded project. And so we worked on representing these dynamics of power on, on through the web and also in uh, repurposing some uh, tools and devices for exploring the web in the right way according to what the web means today. And that was the first encounter. 2000, 2010, we met. 2011, we started working on this research project and really that changed our perspectives. And I will say how for what I can today. The second meeting <laughs> was with the humanities and we met the Stanford Humanities Center that was 2011 uh, with a specific initiative that is the Mapping the Republic of Letters project. And this is a representation that uh, has been done uh, by a former member of Density Design Lab. So maybe it's a new way of documenting projects and initiatives. This was a kind of a panorama collecting all the elements of this initiative, this project together with the timeline on, on the bottom. And um, some people of uh, Density Design were working on a, on, on a project that they presented at, at New Orleans in 2011 at SIGGRAPH, was called the Project City Murmur, was one of the first attempts we did uh, on analyzing uh, the feed of the news in order to represent cities in a different way. These were the outcomes. You can see on, on the left a map with the streets that were more or less evident according to what local news were saying about these streets. So the thicker the line, the street, the higher the number of news related to that street and the color was representing the topic. So crime is black, green is about green and so on. On the right, you can see the, um, the, the, the project and, and the New Orleans um, version of the tool that were, have, uh, has been presented in 2011 New Orleans and that's where uh, we met uh, Nicole Coleman that was actually attending the conference that was representing the Stanford Humanity Center there. These are other representations of. And again, there is a, a network here. There's a semantic representation of the city where you have the, the, the nodes that are um, topics and uh, the edges are links and, and they represent the street that talks about, let's say, in a way about these topics. And what was interesting of these two meetings, I mean, these two encounters, both with the social sciences and the humanities, and that both were arrived to us with a kind of a call to action. So they were, in a way, more prepared than us to engage in a relationship. Well, uh, actually, it was to call to action. The first one was by Latour itself, that in 2008, so three years before we met, wrote in, a, in one of his papers a clear, very clear call to action. So he was searching for designers. We didn't know that. We discovered three years later that he was needing designers and especially communication designers as we are, the visualization competencies that we can bring in order to do what she was, he was doing. For humanities, the same. So they were still yet already talking about um, design and communication design especially. So in 2010, there was a conference that were clearly was stated this need of design, communication design in the field of digital humanities especially. So they said, I mean, we have to learn and communication design is vital for the development of humanities and digital humanities especially. So it's something that was still very clear for them, but it was not clear for us. And that's where, in, when we met, we were in a situation where they were already doing design, but just without designers. And what I think is that that was because of us we were not ready yet. They were ready to accept and there was a clear, clear call to action. We were not ready. We started a few years later. These are some initiatives that we started at Politecnico with other colleagues. So they were not connected to our encounters with these two disciplines. But there were some, there were some signs, but it was really a kind of an early attempt. So even if you look at our thesis today, there is really uh, very few about humanities and social sciences. This is a visualization that we made in our lab of all the tags connected to the thesis of our master students in Politecnico di Milano. These are all the programs we have in Politecnico, fashion design, interior design, pro services and design. These are all the keywords. If you search for humanities and social sciences, you, you find very few elements. Culture, yeah, communication is better than others. Uh, art, is more related to interior design. I don't know what, why, but it's okay. Human, very few humans here. 
society is something, but you know, I, I think it's not enough. So we started a kind of a process, or I did that especially, of you know listen, trying to listen more to this discipline and try to learn something from that. And I will share with you, I, I take, took this opportunity to reflect on that, and I share with you some of the learnings the most important learning, learning so far, I think, I got from this frequentation with this uh, engagement with, with uh, social sciences and digital humanities. First, what I learned, new meanings, deeper meanings for terms that I thought I knew. <laughs> and the first one is this one, seduction. Pronounced with a mix of terror and uh, lubricious desire. But because what it means, the engagement with digital humanities, especially huma humanists, brought me to think that seduction is really what it means. <laughs> uh, if you go to the origins of the word, it comes from the Latin seducere, that means lead aside. And that's the fear of humanities was when we met exactly that, that the visualization of data, this kind of very effective visualization of cultural artifact could lead them away or aside their interpretation of, of, of the data. So they were not struck, or not only struck by the beautiful, I mean, <laughs> evidences that came out from this kind of visualizations, but what they were uh, you know, scared the most is about the fact that it is a kind of degree of arbitrariness in the visualization of cultural data if you use data visualization as a tool. So they were, in a way, scared more than excited about that. Um, so that's where I also learned uh, to be a bit more skeptical about, I didn't realize that before meeting these people, be more skeptical about visual models. We are, there are plenty of visual models that we use to do data visualization, but some of them, graphs especially, they have a lot of issues that bring and so that's, that's where really I started thinking to graphs, especially in a kind of a different way, a bit suspicious way. So I, 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 I was, and we were, let's say, kind of in, in the middle between the, this kind of reluctance from the humanities and, and the excitement of the other people from the sociology. I mean, they were really, really, when we met, excited by the possibilities of embedded into graph representations. And it reminds me, uh, a sentence that I borrowed from the, the, the blog of Scott <laughs> Weingart. And it's, it was really true for the people we met in Paris, in Sciences Po, the Media Lab. They were really excited about the possibility to represent these masses of qualitative, quantitative, social data through graphs and networks. The idea was when we, we have a network, let's draw a graph. It's not by chance that they invented what is called, you no, know, sometimes called, the Photoshop of graphs, and they produced probably one of the most successful commercial product to represent graphs. So they were so excited that they did this kind of product. But at the same time, they were in a way probably not totally aware of the weaknesses and the issues brought by graph and actual visualization. So that's why we decided, in a way, I decided to put myself between in between that. And it was a very, very good and fruitful position. So we started using as 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 the more we uh, started working with uh, with the humanities, uh, the more we started using graphs, and the more it was evident that there are some issues with graphs. These are representations of the uh, word used by Kant in his opera. All the opera, if you connect all the words, you get this kind of messy graphs. We tried. I mean, if you you can turn it around, but it's always well. There are some cases where the graph could be useful. The the words that you see around, you know, expelled, exposed on, 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 the, on the borders. They are the words used just once by Kant. So this is, in some cases, the messiness can become meaningful. But in, often you come, you, you get, take away, you, you, you go away from the graph and you represent data in a different way. That's what Valerio Pellegrini, for example, did in his master's thesis. So reducing and diluting in a way, the complexity of the graph through a kind of a linear visualization. And then in the end, we had a physical visualization, a poster. It was two meters for one meters. And it was in the office of these uh, philosophers studying Kant as a kind of a physical tool. Um, yeah, there, there are many ways to represent graph nowadays. It's, it's a kind of a, 
very open discussion how a graph should be represented. There are many different techniques that are studied and I, I'm not sure there is anything really successful so far. I mean, the attempts are very, you know, there are many attempts, but I wouldn't say I'm satisfied with any of that. And the more we started using a graph, this is the version of graphs we use with the sociology people. And the, the more I, I, I tend to focus the attention to something else, not the graph, the visualization itself, by, but the people using the graph. We started with physical, statical paper representation of graphs. And that's where I noticed something that maybe you can't notice in this picture. Look at the finger. What is at the beginning, at a certain point I realized, uh, well, I want that finger because that's the, the finger is what maybe could be, maybe it's not changing the way you visualize the graph that really can bring somewhere, but the way you create a relationship with a graph. So I started thinking to the idea of trying to use this interaction mode as a way to, to change the relationship with network data. We made some attempt. This is a visualization of the uh, something you see, you, you already seen the, the tags of the, the, the keywords of attached to the thesis. And in that case, it was one of the first um, uh, first projects we used really interactive, gestural in a way visualization, trying really to bring this finger into the project. Something I learned, third point, some th third learning point is this idea of second degree objectivity. Does anybody know what it is? I didn't know before meeting Latour and reading some of his books. And the idea is that there is no truth, no objectivity. The only chance you have to reach something close to objectivity is to multiply the points of view and the points of observation. And the more numerous and partial are the perspectives, the more objective and impartial will be, could be the observation and so the representation. That was again a kind of a changing in, in the way we faced all the projects then. So we started, um, we opened a new, I would say, wave of projects where we tried always to multiply the points of view. This is an example of a project around car sharing systems in Milano. And it's not by chance that here, one of the, I would say, unconscious attempt was to really multiply, create as the highest number possible of views on the same data set. So here you have three different views, but there are much more, there are many more in the website. So we, th there was a data set, there was a phenomenon behind, and we tried to, you know, create as much views as possible, maybe in the unconscious uh, tendency to follow the direction of, of Latour. And we are doing the same with another project that is about data that comes from mobile phones and social media. It's about a city and, you know, cities are such a complex phenomenon. And, and the only chance that maybe we have to represent this complexity is to, you know, again, to increase as much as possible the number of views we can open on the city. And it's the same that we did with some of the tools created uh, for for the Humanity Center at Stanford, the Palladio works on the same way. So you can pass from, move from one view to another. You can, you know, create a cascade of these views. And it's something that, you know, help in kind of coping with the complexity of the phenomenon. Another thing I learned is how much uncertainty is important. That's, all, again, something that you sometimes forget when you work with data. It's something that is coming back especially with big data, we have a lot of different uncertainties to cope with, but it was not that clear when we met humanities and social sciences, but especially with humanities, that became very clear. Um, it was very clear is one of the first sentences that I heard from Nicole Coleman in, in, uh, in Stanford. I mean, she said, I mean, there is kind of something misleading in the rhetoric, in the language that we are using to visualize humanistic data. And I was really um, uh, struck by this idea of something that is not well defined as a, any humanistic uh, phenomenon. So this idea of not being defined is, is, is really quite connected to something that is, should be known by any designer. So 
some of the most important traditions about design, they, they stated you know, years ago that we are the people as designers that should work with ill-defined problems or weak problems. And that's something that really created a connection with a kind of uncertainty, undefined questions that the humanists have to take on. And so we started, I would say not that much, but trying to you know, cope with these ideas of how to visualize uncertainty, ambiguity, noise, errors, gaps, all these things that normally are claimed away by computer scientists. There's anyone here, but sometimes, sometimes not often. But that could, this dust that you have in the data could be very, very useful and important for the interpretation of, for example, a humanist. Again, there are many techniques that are you know, studied in order to try to cope with the uncertainty of data, but maybe again, we can move away with, from this technical approach and try to think to something else. And what today I, I catch is this tendency, for example, in data visualization to, to be less precise. I mean, there is a kind of a trend nowadays on sketchy and drawing data visualization. I don't know if you saw that. I mean, it's, it's a kind of a, there, there are people, not only people drawing by hand uh, this, this data, and one of these comes, you know, ha had a past in our lab, Giorgia Lupi, with a Dear Data project. But there are also people that are now trying to bring back this hand drawing data visualization into technology. So they are creating this, as Elijah Mix is doing, this kind of, you know, hand drawn <laughs> this, uh, JavaScript blocks that you can use for your dynamic interactive visualization. And so maybe a graph like that would be imprecise enough to be more interesting for the kind of disciplines we are working with. Another thing I learned, there are a couple more, don't, don't worry, <laughs> is to work really how to work together. And that was not easy at all at the beginning, working together with these two disciplines was not easy at all. But we started quite soon because it took, I would say, one year to realize that there is no other way to bring this discipline together that really bringing these things, these people together physically on the same place. It was, I th I'm not sure the book from Google about the design sprints was released, published yet, but that's what we did. We did a kind of a design sprint for the first time, design and humanities together in Stanford 2012. That was a very, very fruitful month. It was not the kind of typical design sprint today. It's a one week. We spent one month together working designers plus humanists in the same place, in the same space all day on, in that case, was early modern time and networks. And it was really, really something very fruitful. And I learned two other concepts that I, I, I shared with you in the same words I heard that time. It was 2012. Uh, then Elderstein, uh, studying, I think he studies French, was saying something like that. I mean, what, is, what visualization is useful for is not only to show what we know in a different fashion, but also to reveal what we don't know. But more important than that, he said, what we could not visualize is more important than, some, than what we can visualize. And that's something that connects to something that is happening in this room in these days and the, the work we are doing with the six degrees of bacon, I think. And that's where the, the idea of really bringing these people together into the same uh, one place came. And that's where, after this workshop, the idea of the Humanities Plus Design Lab at Stanford uh, took place. And we were part of it at the beginning. And nowadays, we are no more part of it. This lab has been incorporated into the SESTA lab. But I'm happy to see that they are going on with this relationship with designers. So it's not just with us, they are now calling other designers and doing the same thing we did together in the same place physically in sprints or workshops or whatever. We continued in this kind of activity, working together, sharing the same space in the cost action we're involved in. Nowadays, we are part of this big challenge, I would say, to bring in Europe this idea of reassembling the Republic of Letters. And that's where we brought again the idea of doing design sprint together, designers, humanists, and people from technology. We use a classic model. 
And again, we leverage on something that is known in the humanities. So the fact that for doing your work, you have to prototype, doing projects, beta testing, and look at the results. So that's something that is really connect again, design and digital humanities. A design sprint of that kind includes design, and that could be obvious, but includes design for one specific purpose. That is, at first, the idea of sharing the vocabulary and sharing the knowledge, not, of course, not for creating designers out of a humanist or vice versa for creating humanists in design. But the idea is that we have to find an occasion to share our language and to create things together physically in the same space. This is how typically work. And if you have the chance to pass by this room, you will see something similar. Normally it's, there is Monday you start and you unpack the problem and you there is a picture that represents this, the designer on the left, on the right, some people from the humanities. So typical unpacking the problem from a designer. Then you have Tuesday, you start sketching things and then you come up with usual drawings. And I mean, I can see always this, but again, maybe working by hand is important in the, you know, unprecise and uh, blurred projects. We are, we are called to work together. And again, this is what happens normally on Tuesday. And then on, yeah, that's me sketching with some uh, another humanist. And um, Wednesday, you converge and you make some decisions. You, yeah, you turn your ideas into hypotheses for a project. And that's what happened in, um, in Como, where we met for the cost actions, for the reassembling the, the, the public of letters. And then on Thursday, you start creating prototypes. And these are some of the prototypes that were presented on that specific sprint and on Friday you test. And what happens is that, I mean, if, if you work with humanists normally, they are also representative of the user in a way. And it was in that case, in, in Como was really, for me, it was striking how much we produced in one week. So we were able to create something at the, at the end together that was, was in a way tested and was kind of solving some of the issues they brought. What I learned also is that design as of course humanities and sometimes social sciences is a discipline based on translation and interpretation. Communication design especially can be really intended as a discipline that has translation and interpretation as the main key competence. And that's again something that connects to some ideas that comes from the digital humanities. So the fact that even the data we are meant to visualize are not nothing more than interpretations that are constructed, that are not there, is something that you take and you build in a way. In the same way, we interpret social need and build on top of that something. So this idea of designers being translators as humanists is something that is becoming nowadays in a way studied in, in, in our discipline. I have some colleagues working on that. So the idea of design as a translation discipline and translating needs, translating things that are not yet visible. And again, that was clear you know, for, for the humanities in 2003. If you look at how they talk about design, rhetoric and design and translation. So that that's something that was in a way embedded into the culture of digital humanities looking at design. Translating and interpreting doesn't mean only that given a data set you can create out of 25 different visualizations as in one of the recent posts by Nathan Yu in Flowing Data, the blog, but maybe could mean, and that brings back to some of the projects we did some years ago, to the possibility to create together with, for example, the humanists, artifacts that are not just visualizations of data, but that are interpretation of the data and that creates something that is unique and maybe not replicable, but as, as a different value. So it's a, it's a construction, it's a cultural construction based on the data, but it's not just visualization. I don't know if you know him, but it's something that resembles or reminds me the diagrams and the piece of art of Marco Lombardi in 2009, no, he died in 2000, so it was around the end of 90s. 
we did some experiment of that. The, 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 this chart I'm showing has been constructed literally on the same desk with people from Stanford and us, and has been published into a newspaper in Italy. But it's been really a dialogue, creating a diagram based on some very few data. And that's what probably could be the interpretative activity of design on top of data. And that's something that we repeated again with another person that was an architect and with this, his idea of uh, how some cultural actors were also architect in a way. We have people like Freud, like Wit Wittgenstein. And this is a visualization of relationship, of dates, of some typical metadata that you have in the humanities. But the construction at the end is the result of a dialogue between, let's say, a humanist and a designer and is an, clearly an interpretation, qualitative interpretation of the data. But I, I mean, this is a direction we should look more nowadays in the, ad, in the age of you know, big data, uncertainty, and drone visualization. I think this is something that we have to rediscover, especially with, with picture. I mean, talking about big data and the kind of data we are working with today, picture is one of the most interesting, and this is a sentence from uh, taken from the presentation of one of my current PhD students. He's working on pictures. And the idea is to go beyond the typical analytical approach to pictures. So there are plenty of examples of you know, analysis done on such a rich ensemble of data that you know, organize these pictures according to some basic features like color, hue, saturation, whatever. We are trying to do something different. So go along this line of interpretation and create new cultural artifacts that are based on this data, but that produce a different new meaning. We did something, some experiments, for example, with pictures taken from Google about two very controversial states like Israel and, and Palestine. And we took the pictures, we started playing with the, with the pictures, I would say in the usual way. So separating colors and or organizing pictures according to color and, and other features, then you know, selecting the different topics, so national flags and all the symbols. But then we try to use some of the more constructive techniques in order to elicit some new meaning from, from the pictures. For example, if you apply the typical, you know, multiply effect on faces, on data that you get from picture related to the most prominent political actors in this place, you see the difference in Israel and in Palestine, how important is certain person in, in, in Palestine and how more blurred is the political you know, leadership in Israel. That's something that you can infer and you can extract in a way mm -hmm. if you construct uh, something more than just analysis of the picture. It's something that we, we have done also with territories. A territory is again, it's a kind of complex phenomenon. It's difficult to capture this, um, the, the complexity of a territory just, you know, calculating the average color of pictures or just organizing pictures according to topics or you know creating this collage of the pictures again organized by topic and, and color what again a master thesis student started doing is to create uh, new artifacts that is not this one that you are seeing but for example this one these are like postcards about the monuments in Italy and how different countries from the Mediterranean area see the monuments in Italy. So according to the ranking of these pictures in Google, this new artifact is constructed. So it's data driven, but it's a new artifact, a new cultural artifact that reflects in a way the imagery of this country um, in relation to monuments in Italy. So of course, the bigger the image, the more the higher the ranking in Google, and uh, also it's something that affects also the foreground background relationship. But you can do the same with other kind of topics, like for example, landscapes and create these fictitious landscapes that of course don't exist, but they are a creation that it reflects in a way the perception of the other countries towards Italy. And that's something I think is very useful, much more than just analyzing masses of pictures in a quantitative way, maybe as designers with all the learnings that we have from the different disciplines, maybe we can start producing 
artifacts that are that interpret you know the uh, interpretations of the data but any visualization is an interpretation by the way so i think it's better to engage in that way so we did the same with lombardy these are in a way pictures of a landscape you see the the ground then the sky or the sea or whatever this is built again collecting from all the world all the pictures depicting the lombardy this is our region in italy with and organizing them in a certain way. And my PhD student, uh, Gabriele Colombo, is now working in Paris with, uh, again, with the social sciences, the media, the and science po, trying to build an atlas of the green in Paris, but according to the perception of people. So, and then create a kind of a correlation between what is the current actual green in a city and how it's perceived by the people. And again, there is a classical analysis by Cor, you, whatever, but then at the end, there is also the attempt of constructing something that represents the perception of people. And of course, it's an, an interpretation, it's very subjective, it's very personal. But maybe this is also one of the research lines we have to focus on. So these were the major learnings I could extract from our relationship with this. And I have two more that is, I would say, the future or is something that I'm trying to learn but I think is not yet done. The first one is to extend the rhetorical playground in the sense, I mean, we are now more or less working on the traditional metaphorical rhetorical uh, registers and, 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 and languages. One language, one area, one discipline from the humanities that I think is very, very interesting for us is, is poetry. And that's what I talk about and uh, that was the subject of my presentation in, in at IEO. And that's, I think, a field where we can really learn a lot. So much more than visual metaphors, poetical approaches to, to data could be very useful in depicting the uncertainties and the complexities of the actual challenges. And just to give an example, this is a project done by one of our master students and was a, about, um, you know, HIV and how much this phenomenon is still very important and growing in also the most developed countries, but nobody's taking that much attention anymore. And that was based on very simple data. And she tried to convey this idea of, you know, how these fluids are still circulating and creating some kind of, you know, the, the infection is still alive and is, is growing also in these countries and contexts. So it was, I would say, totally analogical, <laughs> completely interpretative and, 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 and absolutely not analytical, but I think could have a role in one of the different moments of the relationship that we can build, for example, with a citizen about data. And so using these drops and yeah, more or less based on some very uh, you know, weak data, she built this kind of visualizations of yeah this is not made of course any kind of analysis but can be a starting point an introduction to the awareness of what the phenomenon is nowadays can't calculate, of course, the circumference of the drop, but it's based on data. That's just a message, I would say, but I think it could work. He made different, uh, she made different uh, attempt. This is the first one. In another one, she used uh, the sound in a different way, just to convey the difference between the healthy blood and the you know, non-healthy infected blood. Well, it's not, I mean, it's, it's a first attempt. I think we have, as I said, to try harder and to learn much more, but I think that poetry can be definitely one very interesting domain to explore in within the humanities. Also because poetry I discovered in Italy, for example, had a very strong political role, for example, in making some laws and uh, rules accepted by society. So maybe as designers, we can learn 
from that also when we play with data visualization. There is, in the magazine that I was presenting through the covers, there was an idea of reform of poetry in the 70s that I think could be kind of a, the driving force for a reform of data visualization, especially when working with these um, new challenging disciplines. They claimed in the 70s for collective consciousness, readers' participation, new languages, and interdisciplinary collaboration. Isn't that something that we can apply as designers working in data visualization with these disciplines? I think yes. And the second and last must try, I have to try harder, is this kind of so short circuit with the humanities that I, we tested, I tested with, um, in another workshop uh, I attended uh, at Georgia Tech. They uh, well invited some people to work with the humanities in a workshop that was very, very interesting because we had the chance, I had the chance to play with a very specific um, humanistic activity that I didn't know at all at before, that is the acrasis. Do you know what it is? It's poems that talks or represent paintings or images, cultural images. So the, the, the challenge was to use metadata related to a crustic activity and to represent that through visualization. So the data set per se was not that complex. And so we tried in a way to find a very, I would say, um, communicative visualization patterns as, you know, the, the, uh, the Voronoi tessellation and combining this these things in order to, to obtain an effect that could resemble the, 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 the painting that the, the poem was talking about. And at the end, we created a visualization. We decided to go for the tree map that also for Ben Schneiderman is becoming some kind of art. So we walked all this along this line. And so we decided to create this very simple tree maps uh, that described the activity of acrasis on a specific poem. And then what we did is that we retransformed the visualization into a painting. And that can be subject of an acrasis itself. So it gets a kind of a short circuit that maybe, well, I don't know if it works, but I think it's something that we should work on. Thank you. <laughs>